Hey, welcome back to graph theory. This is our um, third and final video lecture from the section 4.1 on distance. And in this one, we're going to specialize and talk about some properties about distance in trees. <clears throat> so you can see the goals of the lecture there. We're going to look at several properties of trees. I just uh, clipped some from your book. We'll take a look at them. We won't prove them here in this lecture. We are going to prove uh, theorem 4.2 from the text. I've got it stated below. Um, it's a property about centers of trees. And then we're gonna prove another property about centers of trees that in particular, any di diametral path in a tree will always contain every central vertex. All right, so that's the... Um, so let's take a look at these properties. Uh, uh, you can take these, uh, uh, they're also in your text. I just kind of put a picture of them here so that they're written a little bit neater. Um, the fifth one uh, uh, is the one that we're going to prove. That's our third goal, that in every tree, every diametral path includes all central vertices. So we are going to prove this fifth one here today. But uh, uh, the other four I won't be proving here in this lecture. Uh, I would encourage you to. They're all uh, absolutely fantastically within reach uh, in the level of exercises, and they'd be a good way for you to uh, play around and get some more experience proving things like this about graphs and trees. All right, so <clears throat> let's take a look at the statement of this theorem 4.2 here. Uh, it was first proved by uh, Jordan in, in 1869, so it's not a new theorem, but let's take a look at what it says. So uh, if, if you take a tree, then the claim is that its center will always consist of exactly one vertex or uh, a pair of vertices that are adjacent, uh, that there's an edge between them. So the center of a tree always has one vertex or two vertices that are adjacent. So uh, you can check, check out the proof uh, in the book. It's basically the proof that I, I'm going to give here, but I'm, I tried to make it just a little bit more formal. I'm going to be uh, inducting on uh, the order of our tree. So my proof is going to be a proof by induction, and I'm going to induct on the order of a tree. So uh, uh, let's start off here by taking a look at the uh, a couple of base cases. If you have a tree of order one or two, well, I've drawn both possibilities here, and uh, uh, you can check it out that the uh, center in this first case consists of the one and only vertex that's there. Uh, the eccentricity of that vertex is zero. So that graph has radius zero, diameter zero. The uh, uh, center is the periphery. It's absolutely uninteresting. In this graph, both of the two uh, vertices have eccentricity one. So therefore, they are also both central and both peripheral, and the center of that graph consists of those two vertices. So that's what the theorem says. The theorem says that the center of a tree always has a single vertex, like the n equals one case, or two adjacent vertices, like the n equals uh, two case down here. All right, so now we gotta carefully formulate our induction hypothesis. I'm gonna do this by strong induction. So I'm gonna say for some n that's at least two, that any tree, any tree of order k, well, k could be from any number between one and n. I don't know which one it is and I don't care. I'm gonna assume that all those trees basically satisfy the uh, a hypothesis. They have centers that are a single vertex or a pair of adjacent vertices, okay? So that's my induction hypothesis. It's important. Any tree of order up to n, and is some number at least two, satisfies this theorem. And then what have I got to do? Well, I've got to show that if you take a tree with order n plus one, it's going to satisfy the theorem. So give me a tree with n plus one vertices. And um, <clears throat> let me denote by E, uh, uh, dangerously, because I don't mean all edges, I denote by E, it's a set of a subset of the vertex set. It's all the leaves of the tree. Remember, a leaf is just a vertex of degree one. So E is the set of all leaves. And, and, and we've proven uh, uh, some things about this, right? We know that trees have at least two leaves. So that set E isn't empty. And I'm gonna define a new graph by uh, taking all of those leaves off of the tree T. All right, so I just remove all of the leaves. Uh, uh, graph theorists call this pruning the tree, removing all of the leaves from T. Uh, and, and remember, when we remove a vertex, we remove adjacent edges. So you're going to take away uh, a bunch of leaves and the edges that were adjacent to them. It gives me a new tree. It's a new tree because uh, taking away uh, uh, these leaves can't introduce cycles, and it also won't disconnect the graph. And, and because we have at least two leaves, this new tree, T prime, its order is less than n. It's one of these numbers, k that I am assuming. So that new tree satisfies the, the hypothesis, the induction hypothesis. 
the center of that new tree, I'm denoting it by C of T prime, uh, uh, it is by induction a single vertex or a pair of adjacent vertices. All right, but if you're looking at your book, you have this, I'll scroll back up, that fourth property that I didn't say anything about up here, that fourth property says that, um, no, 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 not the fourth one, excuse me, the second property, P42, uh, uh, that all eccentric vertices of a tree are N vertices, they're leaves, okay? So, so if you're an eccentric vertex in a tree, you have to be a leaf. So what does that mean? If I look at the eccentricities in this new tree of say a vertex, just writing E of V like we do for eccentricity and I put a T prime there to tell you what graph I'm talking about. The eccentricity of that thing, well, uh, it has to be exactly one less than what the eccentricity of that vertex was in T because in the, in the tree T, V's eccentric vertex was a leaf and we took that leaf away. So, so the eccentric vertex to V in the tree in the tree T prime is one closer. Okay, so so that that's the a result of property P four two. So so uh, uh, what does that mean? It means that the center won't change if you're decreasing every single eccentricity by exactly one. Then you're not going to change the ones that have the smallest eccentricity. So this new tree, the pruned one T prime, uh, it's got the same center as T. So C of T uh, uh, also has a center that's a single vertex or a pair of adjacent vertices. And since T was any tree of order n plus one, by induction, we've proven it for any tree. All right, so you can ask me questions about that. Uh, I won't chat about it too much here to keep the video short. Uh, I did draw a little example to show you what it would be like to, to prune a tree. So, so here, uh, uh, just real quick, on the left-hand side of your screen there, I've got a tree called T. I didn't count its order, you can count it. But what I did write uh, uh, next to every vertex is its eccentricity, all right? So I've colored uh, uh, the leaves of that tree red, so it's easier for your eyes to see them. Uh, and I've colored the two central vertices, the vertices of minimal uh, eccentricity four, I've colored those things blue or excuse me, green, I've colored those things green. Here are your two uh, central vertices right there. All right, and then the tree T prime is, is over there, the pruned tree. Just uh, delete the red vertices and the edges adjacent to them and you're left with that. Well, it's actually a path, but, but it's a tree, T prime. Uh, and uh, I recomputed uh, the eccentricities and look, the, we just like we proved, they all dropped by one. They all dropped by exactly one. Uh, uh, and so the two minimal ones, they're, they're not minimally four anymore, they're minimally three, but they're still the, the two smallest, they're the, the central vertices, it didn't change. If we pruned that tree again, uh, 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 can you see, see uh, it would just sort of shrink the length of the path. Um, yeah, maybe I can do, it. Uh, I don't really have room to do it, but, uh, and then if you pruned it again, you'd be left with the uh, case n equals two. Nice, okay. So uh, let's try to see if we can't walk our way through a proof of uh, the last statement up there uh, that we began the lecture with. It's property P45. Um, it's an exercise in the text, but I'm gonna prove it here with you guys in this lecture. That if you take a tree and you take a diametral path, you remember that that's a path of length diameter between two peripheral vertices, antipodal vertices that that path would have every single central vertex on it. Yeah, uh, maybe while we're stating the theorem, we could look at this picture up here. Here's a tree, can you see a diametral path? Should I shade one and say a color like uh, blue or how about, how about red because it was uh, between the uh, uh, leaves. So the diameter of this graph at a glance is seven. I can pick two vertices uh, 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 of uh, eccentricity seven. And in a tree, there's exactly one path between them. It's that path. And sure enough, that path contains the two central vertices. The theorem uh, uh, property P45 says that that is always the case. Maybe in, a, in class discussion, if you wanna join uh, live, we, we could talk about uh, uh, applications of this. There's some interesting uh, applications, think, things, ways to think about what this means. Okay, well, let's get down to the business of proving it. <clears throat> so here we go. Take your tree and let's just give ourselves some short notation. Let's call its diameter D for shorthand and its radius R, okay? 
and then take a diametral path, call it P, and here I need some notation for its vertices. So it's a path of length D, so it has uh, vertices indexed from zero to D, and I'm calling those vertices U's. Uh, uh, let's pick some element on the center, some vertex in the center of the graph, let's call it uh, uh, Z. And, and I'm gonna kind of proceed by contradiction and suppose that uh, Z is not in the edge set of this path. That's what I mean by that. All right, so I've drawn a little picture down here to kind of help you keep my, uh, my thoughts organized, your thoughts organized. Here's my path P, there it is. Its vertices are in indexed U0, U1, and so on. It ends with UD. Uh, and I've got this central point uh, uh, Z, it's not on my path, All right? D is in the center. Remember that we called the uh, radius R, or Z, excuse me, is in the center. So, so keep in mind that the distance from Z to any other vertex in this graph is less than or equal to R, right? That's because Z is a central element. It's, it's eccentricity is the radius. It's eccentricity is the radius, so you can't get further away from R. It's good to keep that in mind as we proceed through this proof. Okay, <clears throat> so here's a, 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 a first of many claims. I claim that there's a unique index, I. You can, uh, oops, uh, uh, visualize it uh, right there if you want. There's a unique index I. Uh, uh, it's somewhere between zero and D that the, the Z UI path doesn't have any edges in common with the path P. All right, so you can kind of imagine what I'm talking about here. If I pick some of these vertices, uh, uh, I know in this tree that there's a path from Z to that vertex U1. And if that path doesn't have any edges, it's the only path, it's unique because we're in a tree. And if it doesn't have any edges in common with this path P, then U1 is the UI I'm talking about. But if the path that Z has to UI does have an edge in P, say it comes in along that edge, okay, well then UI cannot have another path from Z to it, or U1, excuse me, in this case. There can't be anything ending up at Z from U1 if it comes in along this way, because if there were, there'd be a cycle in the tree. So, so you just have to think about it that the paths from Z to, to this path P, they either have common edges with P or they don't. And the one that doesn't is the one that hits the path first, quote unquote, and I'm, I'm gonna call that UI, all right? So you can kind of visualize that in a copy of this picture that I have down here. Here's my UI, I've got my central vertex Z, I've colored them red, and there's a path from Z to UI and it, it doesn't have any other edges in common with uh, uh, the path P. Uh, uh, and, and UI is unique because if there were other paths, we'd get cycles, all right? So I'm gonna leave it at that and let you think about it. Um, so notation. Let me say that V is the vertex on that path, this Z UI path, you can see V right here. Uh, it's the vertex that's adjacent to C. Uh, there has to be a first vertex along the path, and I'm just naming it V, and I'm going to name that edge ZVE, just for shorthand. Um, yeah, v, v might be UI. It could be. Z could have been one edge away. But I, remember, I'm assuming that, that Z is not on the path P. All right? Cool. <clears throat> Moving on here. Claim two. Z is not a leaf. Z is not a leaf. It's not an endpoint out there. There has to be some other edge besides E that leaves Z. Because if there weren't, if there were no other edges, if Z is a leaf, let me just start to show you my proof here. I got the picture, I think, drawn. If, if, uh, uh, if, if Z weren't a leaf, then this vertex V that I've colored blue there, it would be no more than R minus one units away from any other vertex. Uh, how do I know that? Remember Z itself, is no more than R units away. And V and Z are just one. So if Z is a leaf, this is a better picture to be looking at this. If Z is a leaf, well, Z is one unit away from V. Everything else was uh, R units away from Z. So it's no more than R minus one units away from V. That's all my uh, uh, a statement is here. All right. So uh, uh, that would mean that the radius of the graph uh, is no more than R minus one. The V might be a central element. That's a contradiction to what our radius is. Okay, so, so Z is not a leaf. The second picture down here is more accurate. There's at least some other edge leaving Z. Maybe, maybe there's more. I don't know, but there's at least some, some other edge leaving Z. Okay, good. We're doing good. Um, 
let's move on. Third claim, you can kind of see in the picture, there's some element in the vertex set, I'm gonna call it Y, some Y in the vertex set that there's a, the YZ path uh, 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 doesn't contain E, so it's not a path that starts out along V, and, and it has length at least R minus one. There's at least R minus one edges. So I claim that there's gotta be some vertex in the graph that satisfies those conditions that, that you're looking at visually in the picture. Some path that leaves on something other than the edge E and makes it at least R minus one steps away, edges away, right? So why is that true? Well, Z is not a leaf. So I know that there's at least some other path. We already said that I colored, when I colored it red. Uh, there's some other path that's not, not along E. So, so if, if all such paths were of length no more than R minus two, yeah? If all such paths were of length no more than R minus two, visualize, you know, all such paths, sorry, uh, uh, you know, maybe there's a lot of them, but they're all within R minus two edges of Z. Well, wouldn't they all be within R minus one edges of V? Yeah. Uh, and this other side of the tree, this other side, the other side from the edge E, they're all within R minus one edges of V as well, because everything's within R minus edge or R edges of Z. So once again, in that case, if, if there were no such Y, we would kind of come to the same contradiction that we would get something that, that the, the radius was smaller. That's kind of the whole spirit of this proof is that if these things I want aren't true, then R wasn't really the radius, at least so far in the proof. Let's save a surprise for you. Okay, so take such a path. We just proved that it has to exist, so I've got it. I've got a path that leaves Z not along E, it's at least R minus one edges long. And now let's think about this old index I that we got, the unique place where our Z path uh, along E hits, hits the path P. Um, if that I is bigger than the radius, yeah, then we have a problem because that would mean that the distance from U zero to z would be at least r plus one because if if i is at least the radius then if i start moving along this path one two blah 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 i get here i've gone at least r because i've gone i steps and then well i've got to go at least one more to get the z maybe more uh, uh, uh so so that would mean that that path has uh, a length at least r plus one so so z wouldn't be central its eccentricity would be bigger than R, right? Okay, so that means that I has to be less than R. And then a little bit of algebra means that minus I is bigger than minus R. And so D minus I is bigger than D minus R. What's D minus R? D minus R is this other side's length. That path over there has length D minus R. So once again, the distance, uh, oh no, excuse me, not once again, pardon me, not once again, but rather this time, the distance from Y to UD would be, well, uh, at least R minus one because of, that's how far it takes to get to Z. Remember from Z down to the path UI is at least one and then D minus R is at least what would take, or it's like, sorry, it's exactly what it takes to get over to U sub D. So we would get a path uh, uh, from Y to U sub D that was longer than the diameter of the graph. And that's impossible. That's our contradiction. So, so uh, up until this point in the proof, I kept contradicting something about the radius. The, the surprise I alluded to earlier is that we ended up contradicting something about the diameter. You got a path longer than the diameter. So no matter which way you cut it, um, those that that we got a contradiction. So so Z is actually on the uh, path P. All right, I'm just going to cut it short there, and hopefully we'll have an interesting conversation about this in an online class meeting.